lot more pink in there. See the color? Yeah. A week or so ago, we started treating our goats for worms. Worms are one of those issues that if you have livestock, eventually you're gonna to have to deal with this problem. Last week we made a video about how to prevent worms and maintenance and management practices so that you don't have to deal with them quite so much. In today's video, we're gonna talk about what we do when we finally see that we actually have a worm issue with our livestock, how we handle that problem. She looks good though, doesn't she? Look at that, she sure is. Lacey is looking a lot better today. We can see her eye color, but you can look at Lacey's, just her size, and uh, maybe we can find some older video of her from a week or so ago. She's putting weight on. She's got some a little bit of meat to her. When we first got Lacey, she was overweight. Then she got way too skinny, which clued us into the fact that worms were bu bugging her. And then uh, now she's looking better. <laughs> <laughs> she loves me better. <laughs> she is a nice goat. I love her. I love her. Oh yeah? Yeah. Just name her donkey and then you got your donkey. <laughs> you look okay too there. You look fine, just you look just No matter fine. how much you manage your livestock and rotate your pastures, at some point if you have livestock, you're going to have to treat worms. So What's the deal with that? Let's get into that. Let's talk about the natural myth. Uh, from time to time, we talk about this on our channel. And basically, it's the myth that if you do things naturally, you won't have to deal with any of these problems. Uh, that was, I think, one of our biggest mistakes when we got involved with sheep and goats. Thinking like, hey, nature will take care of everything. If we leave our goats out on grass and in pasture, just like the wild goats of, you know, the wild, it'll be okay. Agriculture is not nature. Yeah, that's why it's the natural myth because at some point in your homesteading career, your farming career, you're going to run into a problem that just won't be able to be solved with herbs. If you look at goats in the wild, goats in the wild have like thousands of miles to range. They can keep moving and eating new things. Those goats won't be as affected by worm load. Or the ones that are will just die. Or they'll just die and they won't keep breeding. But on a farm, you don't have thousands of acres to let your goats just go and not worry about worms. And most of the time, you don't just want to let the ones who have worms die. That just doesn't seem right. <laughs> So you can't just say, well, we'll do, it. we'll do what nature does because you're a farmer, you're not a wild goat herder. Yeah, we tried it, it doesn't work. <laughs> so what do we do when our goats actually get worms and we realize that it's a problem, we're seeing negative effects? There are two, oh. Let's change our scene. leaving. <laughs> we leave. <laughs> we avoid yeah. the problem completely. Pretend it's not All there. Away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on time. Ooh, ooh, I like that. Watch my You want to talk about herbals, foes? Okay, I can do two at a time. On our last homestead on Squash Hollow with our first herd of goats, I had them on an herbal worming regimen. And we never had an issue with worms with those goats. The herbal? <laughs> no, not herbal. Herbal. <laughs> herbal essence. There are plants that grow in nature that naturally can help with a worm load. Have you ever heard of wormwood? That's why they call it wormwood. Unfortunately, wormwood can also kill the goat if it eats too much. A lot of the natural herbal solutions are also toxic to a level where they can even kill your animals. So that is something to pay attention to when getting into the herbal treatment. Those herbal wormers worked for our goats for a long time. We didn't have any issues with worms. Then we brought in some new livestock. We brought in some sheep and a different herd of goats. And that's when we learned that sometimes herbal wormers can fall short. Within about six months of bringing the new livestock onto our property, we lost a sheep to worms. And two goats. We learned real fast that sometimes an herbal wormer just doesn't have enough power behind it to really take care of a heavy worm load. The hard thing with herbal wormers is there haven't been many scientific studies done to prove their efficiency. Uh, the ones you will find are done by companies that manufacture the wormer, so there's a little bit of conflict of interest there. In addition to herbs, homesteaders try things like DE, diatomaceous earth. Basic H, the soap. 
Maybe you've seen it work on your own farm or your own homestead, and that's fine if you have. The problem is there's not a ton of good science out there to prove any of it really works. And the issue we had was when they got that large worm load, it it killed them and the herbals didn't do anything And for it, it can happen, if you don't have a trained eye like us back then, it happened really fast. The animal seemed fine and then it seemed dead. Yeah. And it was. And it was, it seemed dead and it was. <laughs> Don't it's say that. The persons don't like when you say that. More demonetizement. You have to remember when you're dealing with things like DE or basic H or any of these kind of old timey remedies, without scientific proof that they work, you're working off of anecdotal evidence. If you've been using DE on your animals for years and you haven't had any problem, that's awesome. It doesn't necessarily mean it's because of the DE. It could be because of the DE. Just because your data is anecdotal doesn't mean it's not working, but it also doesn't mean that it is working. So go ahead, use all the natural stuff. Just keep an eye out and really monitor the results you're getting from it. And then publish that, please. We would love to have a good study to prove natural stuff actually working. Sad part is sometimes it doesn't, and that's when you gotta bring out the big guns. Yeah. Yep, go ahead, bud. The gate. Yeah. This is why we have goats, if people ask us. <laughs> These are not wild goats. Poor Lacey. We couldn't leave you out in the wild, could we? <laughs> so it's our job to take care of them. To not get mm -hmm. so not get so attached to our ideals that we're willing to let them suffer needlessly. Ooh, blurry. Focused on the gate. Yeah. There we go. A lot of homesteaders get into, you know, livestock and raising your own food because you want better quality food. Right. And when you think better quality, I'm thinking antibiotic free, hormone free, free range, all free. We're not like ready to let's put some medication into them. Let's use antibiotics. Let's use conventional wormers. But then you realize sometimes these livestock for decades have been treated for these exact problems with those chemicals. We've created an animal that is dependent on our care and the care that we've been giving for the last what, however many decades. These aren't wild goats, these are domestic goats and they need a different kind of care and attention and that's where if you can't kick that worm load with you know the herbs, some spices, sometimes you got to pull out the scary chemicals. <laughs> And before we go on and talk about chemicals, let's throw this out there. Wait, let me say it. Austin is not a vet. Just me? You're not. You're not telling me something? <laughs> and we don't play one on YouTube. So this is not going to tell you what to do, what kind of medicines to use. Instead, it's just to explain when do we actually pull out these big guns, these scary chemicals. Yeah, this is what we do. When we can see our animal is suffering from the side effects of a heavy worm load, uh, as you saw in a week or two ago's video, right away we got a fecal done. Make sure it wasn't something else. You know, there could be other things going on. And sure enough, the fecal showed, yeah, it was worms. And we realized that our animals had a worm issue. We took our vet's advice. There are three different classes of wormers. She prescribed two from those three classes. So we had ivermectin and panicur. Fortunately, right now, for us, neither of these girls is in milk and neither of these girls do we plan on eating. As you probably are, I don't like the idea of putting chemicals into livestock that I'm using for food purposes. The idea of putting chemicals? Chemicals are scary. Uh, hey guys. Actually... Huh? <laughs> Who's that? Is that Cody Creelman? Oh man, I love his YouTube channel. He is an animal vet and he does play one on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much guys. Yes, that is right. I'm a veterinarian and I'm a food animal veterinarian specifically And I also play one on the internets. This is Cody Creelman. He is a large animal vet He has been working as a vet. Well, Cody can tell you how long he's been working as a vet I've been a food animal veterinarian for the last eight years I have an animal science degree before my DVM degree and I grew up on a farm we had pigs and chickens, and we ran about 300 head of commercial cattle. So I've just, I've been around animals my whole life, especially farm animals. Cody is here to help answer some of the common questions slash some of the myths about chemical worming, treating worms in general. So Cody, let's cut to the quick here. 
sharp knife, sharp life. Chemicals, they're scary. I don't want them in my animals for food. Chemicals are scary. I don't want my family to be eating chemicals when they're consuming uh, different food products. But one thing that I think is a, a little bit of a misconception is the, what antibiotics or what antiparasitic drugs actually are. And a lot of them come from nature. So a lot of them are molecules derived from bacterial synthesis, molecules that fungi produce naturally as a defense mechanism against things like bacteria, like against things like different types of parasites. So these are molecules that humans are really just exploiting for us to be able to treat parasites efficiently and effectively. But once I give my animals the wormers, how long does it stay in their system? Isn't it in the milk? Or the meat? So every dewormer we give has a different withdrawal time. Uh, it's not in the meat and it's not in the milk if we adhere to strict withdrawal time. So what happens is we give an animal a drug and then we look at the peak plasma concentration. So we take blood samples serially after we give that drug and it gives us a nice curve so we know when their peak plasma concentration, the concentration in their blood is, and when it's completely depleted. So we know when there is no more of that drug in the animal system. Now we take it one step further with meat and milk withdrawal times as we add a safety factor in there. Often that safety factor is hundreds of times longer than it needs to be, but we put it in there to accommodate food safety. I still don't like the idea of putting chemicals into my animals that I'm later going to eat. Is there any merit behind herbal wormers? Get that goat behind you under control. He's like crawling up the walls. So when it comes to herbal dewormers, I think there is some potential merit. Uh, humans have been treating animals with with those types of compounds for thousands of years. I remember even my grandpa just two generations ago told me about how he dewormed all of his horses with a, a handful of pouch tobacco. Uh, while moderately to mildly effective, um, there is better ways. We have better science. We have randomized clinical control. So I do think there is compounds that can potentially treat, but I think most importantly comes down to uh, adhering to principles of things like holistic management, pasture rotation, having uh, genetically selected for animals for your environment. The, all of those things are so much more important as to what the most specific treatment or using the newest, hottest dewormer is. How about DE? Basic age? Yes, compounds like DE, you know, I've, I've heard lots of different uh, mechanisms of action. Uh, the, the most, I guess, one that I could make the most sense of with DE is that the little tiny shells can cut up the parasites and then they die. And Parasitology is extremely complicated. There's all sort of, sorts of insisted larvae and different life cycles and, and the, the parasites aren't always going to be susceptible to things that just have an effect orally within the within the gut contents itself like de would so it's much more complicated than just being able to feed an animal something that would i guess in in theory kind of clean them out so unfortunately i don't think there's too much merit to that fairy dust austin oh austin i thought you were a professional youtuber you just hit 50,000 subs and you're trying to video with your phone on Shut that phone off. But aren't the worms resistant to all the wormers anyway, so what good is it going to do? Resistance does exist. These parasites are extremely adaptive. They have the ability to adapt and to change their genetic profile to be able to survive. These parasites are survivors. So resistance is, is possible, but through prudent usage of these products, through things like testing and then treating, uh, having very good management, limiting our use as much as we can and only using it when we have to, not because it's cheap to, to just do it prophylactically, just willy-nilly. We can decrease the total amount of resistance in the population and be able to use these products for a longer period of time in the future. But come on, Cody. Don't vets make a ton of money when they're pushing Big Pharma's agenda? Aren't you just a pawn in the Big Pharma chess game? Ha <laughs>
Yes, veterinarians have a unique privilege to be able to prescribe and dispense, but my clients are under no obligation to purchase pharmaceuticals from me. I carry the product, I act as a business and a dispensary, and yes, part of my income does come from selling pharmaceuticals, but we are a very regulated industry. We strive to do the best possible medicine, doing gold standard, evidence-based, ethical medicine. So. You have to trust in your veterinarian that he's going to make the best decision for you, even if he does sell the odd bottle of Ivamec or Panicure or Draxin or Exceed or XNL. Or Thanks, Cody, for answering those questions. Cody has an awesome channel. Uh, he's really fun to watch. Go check Cody's channel out. And we'll a podcast. Link to it below and over here too. Hello, Palpation Nation. Welcome to the vlog. How do you treat pink guy? Well, Oxytad has good. Wrong, dart. <laughs> if you choose to raise dairy goats, or you choose, oh, when they break your camera, you'll be ticked. When you choose to bring domestic livestock onto your homestead, at that point, you have taken on the responsibility of those domestic livestock. If you were to buy a car, but then refuse to give it an oil change because you didn't like the whole oil situation and you don't want to support big oil, your car is going to break and it's your fault. If you choose to get domestic livestock from lines that have been given chemical dewormers for decades, you're taking on the responsibility of that livestock and you're going to have to at some point do things that you might not want to in your ideal farm. And make sure you're regularly, routinely checking on your animals and assessing their worm load. If you're using chemical or herbal, there yeah. is no silver bullet. If there was, there would be some rich dude like living somewhere amazing because he had ended the worm problem for the all worm farmers. Man. Worminator. Ah, uh, worminator. Our experience from seven years of owning goats is it doesn't hurt to try the herbal stuff, but you may need to pull out the big guns and use the conventional wormers sometimes. We're gonna pull out the chemicals, and as you can see, Lacey is responding to the chemicals well. It's making her better. And that doesn't make you an evil pawn in the hands of Big Worminator. <laughs> Find a mentor, find a vet you trust. Yep. Go to them for advice. Cody has an awesome YouTube channel where he does all kinds of cool stuff with livestock, all mostly beef cattle. Mm -hmm. I think he owes me a t-shirt. I believe so. Mm -hmm. I think he owes a, a couple t-shirts, so Cody. <laughs> uh, you, you get a lot of, I'm just saying, it will be on this channel like once a week at least. I'll, I'll send you my address again in case you lost it. <laughs> well, we're a new address. Thank you Homesteady for having me on this video. I appreciate all that you guys do. It's been so fun to watch you over the last year or so. You're doing a great job. Love it. Love you guys. Bye. Cody, I'm an XL. She's uh, medium? Medium. Medium. Uh, you. Go check out Cody's YouTube channel. He is so entertaining. And he wears a Homesteady shirt, so you know you can trust this guy. And if you loved this video, please share it. There is so much misinformation on YouTube about this subject, and you can help change that just by sharing this video. Any social media, face-to-face, -face, Instagram, Twitster, Facepalm, whatever social media you use, share it. We really appreciate it.